Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just do this for effect. The effect is I can see. I am delighted tonight to have a very special duty. Our speaker this evening, as you all know, is Ken. I don't even have to say his last name. Everybody knows. Ken is the son of the Central Valley, born in Visalia on a farm with three big brothers. He didn't let them push him around. He just got out of their way. Anyway, we are here tonight because he has written a tremendous book, I am told. I have confess I have not yet read it, but I can't wait to do so. Because, well, the fact is we have had a great deal in common. We both got a start in politics, and his was in law school at Columbia University at the very same time that former Vice President Richard Nixon had decided to go and seek the presidency. Good idea. So Ken, I think you stop and think about it. If you've been paying attention to what has happened recently at the at the very place where you began your political adventure. And I must say, Ken, that as you look down <laughs> and recall what happened when you were first involved in politics, If you've been watching it lately, you thought that it was kind of a bad thing then. <laughs> well, Columbia University at that time was, believe it or not, it was afflicted by students and even members of the faculty who were watching and waiting for an opportunity to raise hell and do no good. So Ken, I wonder if you have been thinking as I have, things haven't changed worth a damn. But it was an interesting place. And it was the beginning of the opportunity that you would have to bring, bring to the real world a lesson at the Ken Kachigian School of Reality. And for the benefit of those <clears throat> in attendance, Ken is arguably, I think, the most influential of advisors to more chief executives at the federal and state level than, than even seems imaginable. Look at this. He served as an advisor on nine presidential campaigns, many, many gubernatorial campaigns, including, fortunately, mine. And if you've been a fan of politics, or if you've even been casually interested in it, you probably wouldn't have missed the David Frost interviews, the deep and personal relationship with Richard Nixon, and to he, to President Reagan's first inaugural address, Ken has been in the room, not just in the room, 
He has been a very important part of what was going on in that room. And in fact, he's been not just a witness, but has played a critical role in determining the outcome of truly world-leading initiatives. Now, I'm going to cease this very shortly. I could go on, but I shouldn't if I haven't read the book. And I haven't yet, but I will because I am eager to do so. But it is a fact. This is true. Nine presidential campaigns, that's a lot. And many, many more, mine being one, I will simply say that the, by the title of the book intrigues me, but what we do know is that it will be not just interesting, but it will be honest, it will be fair, it will be damned interesting, and above all, this is a man who will be honest and fair, but he's tough. He's tough, he's smart. He is something. So without more, I will simply say, listen closely. You won't have to, but he is going to have something to say that is worth listening to. And it's worth listening to because he has the guts, he has the good sense, he has the knowledge. It's extraordinary how much. But above all, what you will find out if you listen, and you won't have to listen hard, that he is one of a kind. He has been at this business for some time, seems to enjoy it, remarkably accurate, but one thing that I think you can say, you know when you listen to him, this guy is not just tough and smart, not just well versed in all that he has done over a period of many years. He is honest as the day is long, tough as hell, but he's fair. With that, I give you Ken, come on up. I humbly accept the nomination, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a great intro introduction. Um, I will say this, everybody agrees with me. Uh, it would be great to have Pete Wilson back in the governor's office, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it took me four and a half years to do this book, and every story begins with a journey. And here's how mine began, uh, by reading an article in the New York Times, um, which we'll put up here on the wall uh, screen. Um, back in January of 1968, and um, that was just one of them. Um, it was about a two-time loser named Richard Nixon. Uh, running for office again. That was just one of them. There was an uh, article, actually, that preceded this by Bob Semple. And I was a political junkie, and I was really interested in politics and, and uh, the fact that he was running again. Now, he was not the favored Kennedy back in those days, uh, believe it or not. He was, he was a two-time loser, having run for president, having 
run and lost for governor of California. And um, so um, I, had, I had met him. You can take that off the, there you go. I had met uh, Mr. Nixon actually in 1962 when I was a student at UCSB. And he was running for governor then. And he was at San Marcos High School. And actually, um, Governor Wilson, uh, may have, he was an advanced man. And uh, where's Sandy Quinn? Sandy Quinn, I don't know if he's still Sandy. One, either the, one of the two of you may have been advanced men at that uh, rally in San Marcos High School. And I met him then. And uh, because I was a political junker, I, I saw this as an opportunity since I didn't think a lot of people would be wanting to uh, help Richard Nixon back in those days. So I thought maybe this is a chance to get involved in a presidential campaign. So I wrote him a letter, my royal typewriter. I was at Columbia Law School in New York. Uh, Meredith and I were living there. I was in my second year. And um, I wrote him a letter at his law office at 20 Broad Street. And um, I never heard back. I thought that was a little rude. <laughs> but I made a carbon copy. I didn't have a Xerox machine in, my, uh, in our apartment. Uh, so I called his office and I said, you know, I wrote a letter to Mr. Nixon volunteering my services. And uh, what, what happened? And they were very nice. They said, well, it must have gotten lost in the mail. Why don't you send it again? Well, good thing I made a carbon copy. Uh, young folks don't know what a carbon copy is. <laughs> but I made a carbon copy, so I retyped it all over again, trying not to make mistakes. I put it in a sealed envelope. This time I had a courier, Meredith, my wife, sitting in the front row. And she was working uh, in an investment management firm on, on uh, 30 Wall Street. 30 Wall Street was just around the corner from 20 Broad Street. So she walked it over and gave it to a receptionist. And I finally heard back from someone in uh, Mr. Nixon's office. And there's that letter. I don't know if you recognize that name. Dear Mr. Kachigian. It was signed by Patrick J. Buchanan. And Pat was a, then he was an aide to uh, uh, Mr. Nixon. And uh, he said, um, I'm sorry we delayed getting back to you. He said, why don't you come on in for an interview? It wasn't the greatest interview in the world. Uh, since I was a Columbia Law student, uh, Pat uh, thought I was a spy from the Rockefeller camp. <laughs> At least that's what he teases me today. But he did, they did give me a job, and I started answering um, correspondence at their office at 521 Fifth Avenue. And I tried to do some research. And Marty Anderson, who was on leave at Hoover Institution, uh, saw some value in what I was doing. And he offered me, as, a, as we approached the nomination in 1968, it looked like more and more that Nixon was going to win. Marty Anderson offered me a job that summer for the presidential campaign. And I got a job working for a fellow named Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan was a domestic policy advisor in that campaign. Well, uh, as things worked out, of course, we won that election. And then I ended up in the White House after I finished my third year of law school. Uh, and came back to California, took the bar exam, and ended up in the White House in 1970. Now, when you, um, I don't know if you had a chance to tour this magnificent facility, but when you tour it, uh, you see uh, the, all the enormous achievements that have been made in the five and a half years of the Nixon presidency. But uh, I do want to say something that's not in my book. Uh, but that when you tour this and you see all the things that were done in the five and a half years that Richard Nixon was president, I want you to understand one thing, that these were, all these achievements were done under huge headwinds. And there were three uh, headwinds that I want to summarize. First, Nixon was a wartime president. He inherited the war in Vietnam from Lyndon Johnson and Jack Kennedy. Uh, when he came into office, there were 540,000 troops in Vietnam. Over uh, 500 uh, troop, uh, troops, young men, were being killed every month in Vietnam. Over 1,000 casualties. The war had been promoted and escalated by the uh, establishment, the Eastern establishment, and the State Department, and the Defense Department, created by Johnson and, and Jack Kennedy. But despite all that, starting in January of 69, it became Nixon's war. 
and it became his burden. And all the protests across the country and all the violence on the campuses and the bombings that were attempted at the Pentagon and uh, all the uh, mass protests all across the country, they weren't blamed on Lyndon Johnson. They weren't blamed on Jack Kennedy or the Eastern Establishment, on Clark Clifford or George Ball or McNamara. They were blamed on Richard Nixon. So that was one big burden he carried. The second uh, headwind he had was that you, people have to remember that the Congress was in the hands of Democrats during the entire time Richard Nixon was in office. The House and the Senate was in the hands of the Democrats. And so any time he had to get any Supreme Court appointment, judgeship, uh, legislation through uh, any executive appointments, uh, any legislation, he had to do it through an adversarial Congress. So that, he, that the fact that he managed to get anything through in the five and a half years, it was through a, a Congress that was uh, a very partisan co uh, Congress. And thirdly, the third headwind was that he was faced with was an antagonistic and negative press dominated by three networks, uh, major newspapers, the Washington Post and New York Times, and Newsweek, Newsweeklies that were unfriendly throughout the time. So I just want to do that, give you that as a backdrop. Anyway, my book mainly uh, is about my years with President Reagan. But what's uh, different about my book, uh, by, uh, it's, it's not a biography, it's a memoir. And what's different about it is that what's central to my story, and, and it's important that I tell it here at the Nixon Library, is that um, as I started to write the book about Reagan, I, I realized that I couldn't write about Reagan because I made it to Reagan's varsity team without, I couldn't have made it without first serving on Richard Nixon's farm team. And, and, that's, uh, and that's why the uh, opening chapters of the book start with, uh, there's uh, four to five chapters that are uh, centrally focused on my time that I worked with uh, Richard Nixon in, in the White House, and then here in, 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 uh, here in California in San Clemente. And so uh, the only way I could open it was with the end of the Nixon administration and the sad occurrences of 50 years ago, uh, this August, of when he was what I call unfairly hounded out of office. And we'll have more to say about that in 17 days when August um, 8th comes around and um, we have the 50-year observance of, of um, President Nixon's resignation from office. But I will say this before I get, uh, get any further, and that is that if we knew then what we know now about uh, some of the research done by uh, my colleague Jeff Shepard, who's become an extraordinary Watergate scholar, that if we knew then what we know now about the unethical judge, Jack Sirica, about the unethical and improper communications between the Watergate judges, the Watergate prosecutors in the Congress, and if we had been better prepared to deal with a adversarial press and an unfavorable media, and if we had a more favorable media, such as a Fox News, to deal with the lawfare that we, we had back then, and if President Nixon had uh, better and more aggressive legal representation, and if we had dealt more aggressively with the press, he would have served out his second term of office. Nevertheless, he lost his political support, unfortunately. And I was on part of his anti-impeachment team back in 1974. So uh, it was inevitable that he had to resign uh, because he lost all his political support. And America was fatigued with the, from the Vietnam War. And in uh, 1973, we had the Arab oil embargo. And Nixon uh, admirably spared the United States from the agony of the further confrontation and resigned office. So that brought us all to, back to California. Um, that August, um, I was still in the White House, and I got a call from Ron Ziegler, who had been his press secretary. And, he asked if I would come back to help out. At the time, um, I, I met with President, I sat down with President Nixon, and, and I found out this unbelievable things that I had never known, and that were the, the pursuers that hounded him out of office uh, had not given up. 
he was at that time the president was was really broke he he had no income uh, from having left office uh, they were trying to get him on his back taxes there were still subpoenas out for him they were trying to disbar him from the new york and california bars and uh, the press were still after him the congress was still after him the press was still after him but I sat down with them, and this was the first time I had really had face-to-face -face meetings because before that I was just a junior staffer. And here he had lost the presidency, the thing that he'd worked for all his life. And uh, I thought that he would be in despair, and I was in despair because I was down having worked so hard to try to defend him. And I sat down with him in San Clemente at the Western White House, and he said to me, Ken, don't get down. You have to look forward. We must look forward. We must look ahead. We can't look back. And this was in August 1974, right after he resigned. What a lesson that was in life. It was just an amazing lesson for Richard Nixon and his indomitable will to return. And I'll never forget that lesson. So San Clemente, the return to St. Clemente was about redemption and transition. And that was uh, what it was about in writing those memoirs and then confronting um, what happened uh, about uh, leaving the administration, uh, leaving the office and, and dealing with Watergate. So the memoirs was part of it. But then he had to make a public statement uh, in, the, in the media and he had to decide how to do that. Uh, he didn't really trust the television network, so he decided on using um, a television, different uh, international personality, and that was David Frost. Um, so that's why one of the chapters in my book, and, and Governor Wilson alluded to that, is uh, using uh, uh, David Frost, who was a television personality. But David Frost was a good interviewer. And so I, there's one entire chapter in my book on the, on the Frost Nixon interviews. And uh, we did an enormous amount of research uh, in those interviews, and I led the research for this. So you can imagine we did a slight amount of preparation for those interviews. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you recognize that young lady on the left. If you, if you recognize her from ABC and CBS News, that's Diane Sawyer. And that... Uh, young man that looks like George Clooney with glasses there. <laughs> and that's Ray Price. Uh, the other fellow is Ray Price, who was President Nixon's chief speechwriter in the White House. Anyway, the, those were the briefing books we used over two months of preparation for the uh, uh, interviews with uh, David Frost. But that, it, was, it was critical that we had to get that done to get behind us. But it's important, it was important to write this chapter because uh, the movie by uh, Ron Howard, the Frost-Nixon movie, was a distortion. And the books about the Frost-Nixon interviews were, have been a distortion. And um, the play. So uh, this is the first inside view of the Frost-Nixon interviews. And um, it was a mo momentous decision on Nixon's part because it got, it got Watergate behind him and it put him in front of the people to, uh, for him to acknowledge that he did, in fact, in, in parts, mis uh, mislead the American people on some of the small things in his judgment. But he said on the big things uh, he's, that he told the American people, it was, it was the fundamental truth. But it was important in his mind to tell Frost and to tell the American people that he did not commit a crime. But more, and, and even more importantly, that he regretted putting America through two years of agony. And as he said, he impeached himself. The, but the whole of it was is that it was a very shrewd decision on his part, allowing him to go forward with, with repairing his uh, life. And, and as he said to me back in that August of 74, of moving forward. Now, going uh, forward in the book, um, I want readers to focus on a lot of the important parts of the life in San Clemente with Richard Nixon. And that are, those are his political observations. Uh, Pre President Nixon, Richard Nixon, was uh, 
probably among the most shrewdest political thinkers in American life. And among, among the most fascinating things in those first chapters deal with uh, Nixon's political analyses of the 1976 and 1980 campaigns. Sometimes I wonder how we ever got those memoirs written. He'd bring me in to talk uh, for about 10 minutes about the memoirs, and the next thing you know, boom, he's asking me about the New Hampshire primary and how uh, Ford's doing against Reagan or about the other primaries. Uh, and he wants to want to know my analysis of the, the, the ads and things like that. And then um, you have to understand that Nixon's idea of relaxation is talking out loud about people and personalities and politics and uh, giving his own opinions on, on them and how, on their strengths and their weaknesses. And there's plenty of that in the book, especially interesting to me was how he assessed Ronald Reagan's strengths and weaknesses in those campaigns. Because um, there are many, many books written about presidential giants and legends, and most are secondhand, and a lot of them are ghostwritten. But you know, one of the unique things about my story, and one that I think is untold, is that uh, it's about Reagan and Nixon's relationship, and it's how Nixon's friendship and collaboration grew in the time that I served the two of them. And part of it is, 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 is how uh, Nixon analyzed uh, Reagan during those times. But the seeds of the bond of the relationship grew during Nixon's presidency. And I think that's a very important historical point. And it came out during one of the conversations we had, because I kept, I kept very, very good notes and kept a diary during that entire period. And Nixon said to me in one of our conversations, and this is important for you to listen uh, here and, for, and to read in the book. He said, Ken, Reagan stuck by me during the tough times of Vietnam and Watergate, and we're going to treat him well in the book. So Reagan's loyalty meant a lot to Nixon. And though they were once rivals, they were rivals in 1968, but Reagan's loyalty to him during those years in, uh, in the 70s uh, with, through Watergate and Vietnam meant a great deal to Nixon. And so he, he, uh, he uh, in his relationship with Reagan, that meant a great, uh, a huge amount to him. I learned a lot about Reagan through Nixon. Nixon made observations about Reagan's communication skills, how Reagan made notes of colors and sunsets and imageries. He talked about that all the time. So I made mental notes about that and later put them to good use. He had great admiration for the way Reagan communicated. He thought that was such a great strength that Reagan could uh, overcome just about everything in politics through his ability to communicate. The only weakness he saw in Reagan was that he didn't think Reagan was a hard hitter. He didn't think he was tough enough. But uh, later on, I think he conceded that Reagan could give a punch when he needed to. He also made observations about Nancy Reagan. I, I think I put that in the book as well. And what a strong personality she was. And then she was also, as he called, called her, a classy lady. He believed she was a strong asset to Reagan. But those were, you have to understand, these are very strong perceptions by uh, Nixon uh, about Reagan and the people, and, and, and the people around Reagan. So it's very shrewd analyses. So as we began to analyze the 1980 campaign and came upon the 80 campaign, I realized that uh, the book was finished and Nixon was restless and it was time for him to go to New York and that meant I was gonna be out of work and, and um, so I was looking to him for some advice and so he, he gave me some pretty good advice. He told me to visit a fellow named Stu Spencer and um, I was, that's when I was looking for work, and Stu was sitting there in the front row, and um, Stu was in Newport Beach at the time. He was a, uh, had some clients, and so I went to see Stu, and, and uh, we, we made an acquaintance with each other, and actually, I think I wrote a small speech for Stu, and, and um, then when um, the time came around, 
um, for um, the uh, 1976, uh, uh, later on when uh, the campaign for 1980 came and uh, uh, Stu was uh, putting the campaign together, he chose me to be a speechwriter uh, for Reagan's campaign. But that didn't happen automatically because um, Stu got in trouble in, in 1976 with the Reagans because he ran Jerry Ford's campaign in 1976. So he wasn't on Nancy's Christmas card list for a long time because they ran pretty tough ads against Reagan. But Reagan's uh, campaign got in trouble in uh, August and September of, of 1980, so they decided to kiss and make up, and, and Stu got brought back on. And Stu, when, when, when uh, the, when Stu got brought up back on, he said, I get to choose how to run this campaign, and we're going to run it from the plane and not from the headquarters. And that means I get to choose the press person, the person who runs the tour, uh, the policy person, I get to have my own speechwriter. And, and he said uh, uh, that, inc that, that included me. And I, so I once asked Stu, I said, why did you choose me? He said, that's because uh, I respected Nixon's judgment on political matters. And then also, I didn't think Nixon would send me an, any idiot. <laughs> he didn't use the word idiot, but this is a family audience. <laughs> so the reason I devote six chapters of the book to the 80 campaign is because I kept the recorded diary, I recorded into a cassette recorder, and because one of the main histories, uh, historical uh, points in this book and, and what I give back to history in this book is that Nixon, Nixon provided memos and detailed advice to the 1980 campaign, secret advice throughout. And that's an important story in this book and important for historians. And it's, uh, Nixon played a silent role in the 1980 campaign. Nixon wrote two secret memos to Reagan in that campaign, and they're in the appendix of the book, uh, and they're reprinted for the first time. And um, along with that, he made secret phone calls to me, and there's an enormous amount of political history in them that have never been told before. And then, uh, of course, uh, the result, uh, not because of that, but the, the result of the, the bad economy and because of a lot of uh, uh, Carter's own blunders and, and of a very successful debate uh, with uh, Carter and Reagan in October, we had a landslide victory. And Reagan came into office with a very nice mandate. Uh, so that was very successful on our part. So with that mandate, Reagan, now we're sort of transitioning into the Reagan part of the book. Reagan came into office as a crusader. And that helps me when I'm asked uh, so often what are the, people want to know what are the differences between Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. And that's not always easy to define because they're such different personalities. But one easy thing to say is, in private conversations, um, President Reagan loved talking about philosophy, about the burden of taxes and big government, and how he wanted to educate Americans on the economy uh, he would always talk about the uh, Americans didn't know enough about the economy, and we just didn't need to teach them about the economy and the bad, how the taxes are bad. And he'd go into long disquisitions on that. And I talk about that in about three chapters in the book. And those were very deep and serious discussions by Reagan. He had a very serious mind. But then when you got into bull sessions with Reagan, casual conversations, his idea of a casual conversation would telling a story about playing a trick on Errol Flynn in the movie Santa Fe Trail, <laughs> or about an officer berating him in boot camp for uh, the role he played in Brother Rat, or maybe telling a story about John Wayne or Bob Hope. Uh, that was his idea of a bull session. Now, on the other hand, with President Nixon, uh, we would also have deep policy discussions on foreign policy, he, you know, where he'd talk about Willie Brandt or Indira Gandhi or Winston Churchill, and we'd talk about economic issues uh, and deep, profound issues of, of 
of, of state, but then his idea of a bull session or a casual conversation would be telling great political stories, uh, maybe about good old Charlie Halleck in Indiana, or his buddy, old friend George McKinnon's advice about uh, running like you're a million votes behind and so you could win by one vote. And he never got tired of talking about politics, uh, or, he, or he'd call me on New Year's Eve and he'd, he'd want to know what the political scene in California was like. So that was Nixon's idea of, of uh, casual conversation. And regarding their communication styles, I think it's both interesting. They were, they, they were interesting in different ways. Um, but there, there's an interesting point uh, for both of them, uh, an interesting point of history in, in, in this regard as well. Richard Nixon uh, never used teleprompters when he campaigned. You see the candidates, they, they all rely on teleprompters. It's really stupid. It really is. Uh, Richard Nixon, when he campaigned in rallies, he never used teleprompters. Um, he, he addressed uh, informal assemblies or uh, campaign rallies without teleprompters at all. He prepared by studying. We gave him fact sheets and suggested remarks. He'd study them and then prepare his own notes, but then he put everything aside and he spoke extemporaneously. He only used teleprompters for formal remarks or State of the Union or something like that, but not for campaign rallies. Now, Reagan didn't use teleprompters either for rallies. He, used, he spoke from the, uh, half sheets like this, like I'm using, only he did a better job. But um, he, he uh, he, and by the way, if you ever look at the Reagan's inaugural address, he didn't use a teleprompter. He used, he used these half sheets like this. So he never used a teleprompter. Um, but he used the love to tell stories, and Reagan used the love to tell stories and illustrations to make his point. And one of my favorite was when he was trying to sell his economic package in 1981 to uh, his economic and tax package. Um, he was out, as I told you, he loved to talk about economics. And he was really outraged about the uh, trillion, uh, the deficit, the, or the, not the deficit, the national debt. Now, in 19, February of 1981, and Governor, you'll appreciate this, because you were in the Senate. Uh, the, the national debt in February of 1981 was not yet a trillion dollars. It was $980 billion. Today, the national debt is approaching $35 trillion. So President Reagan was outraged that it was approaching $1 trillion. And he wanted to use in his speech in February 1981 uh, make it, to make a point that uh, the national debt was horrible and it was approaching a $1 trillion. And he, he so I, I sent a draft up to him uh, at Camp David and he loved to edit his speeches and when he had time. So he, he edited the speech heavily and it came, came back down his handwriting from Camp David and, re, and then he called me when he got back to the Oval Office. He said, Ken, I hope you could read my speech, uh, read my writing. And we said, no problem, Mr. President. There's only one concern we have. And he said, what's that? I said, there's a number in there that you wrote. Uh, it's about stacking a thousand dollar bills on top of one another to reach up to a sky 80 miles high to reach a trillion dollars. I said, Mr. President, where'd you come up with that number? And he paused and he said, by long, long division. Well, I'd like, you to, I'd like you to sometime get on the phone with the president and tell him that you're going to try to correct him. But on the other hand, you can't let a number go out because it's going to be questioned by, uh, the press would question him immediately. So we had to figure out some way to find out how high uh, in the sky a thousand dollar bills would go to reach a trillion dollars stacked one on top of each other, because I didn't have any access to $1,000 bills. But the government, the, the federal government has nerds in every corner. 
And so we knew where we can fight a nerd, and that nerd was in the Bureau of Engraving and Mint. So we made a phone call. I didn't make the, my, my research staff made a phone call. And the phone call came back and they said, oh, that's an easy answer. He said, well, do you want them banded tightly or do you want them loose? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was, uh, if they're banded tightly, it's 63 miles high, and if they're loose, it's 67 miles high. So the president, he was happy that he, he came close, but I think he got out of human events, uh, Stu. Uh, <laughs> got that number out of human events. Anyway, so that's how you like to use the... So the economic recovery uh, succeeded, and it paved the way for the re-election campaign. And uh, President Reagan asked two of us to travel, two of us in the campaign to travel with him in the re-election. That was Stu and me to travel on Air Force One throughout the 84 campaign. And Stu was back in charge of strategy, and I was back in charge of issues and research. And, but once again, President Nixon played a role in that campaign, writing several secret memos and, uh, that you'll find in the back of the book. And he called me frequently uh, on the phone to pass along advice, telling how the economy is the big issue. And, and, he, and he passed along. But the important role he played in the 84 campaign was after the first debate with Mondale. Now, the result was not quite as bad as Joe Biden's was with Trump, but, but Reagan did stumble in that first debate with uh, Mondale in October uh, 1984. And he stumbled a little bit, mumbled a little bit, and so he didn't do well, and our poll numbers went down a little bit, and people wondered about Reagan's age and this, that, and the other. And so Stu said to me, he said, why don't you give Nixon a call? Ask him quietly for some advice on what to do, and also write a memo and ask him to bolster Reagan's confidence after the first debate. And Nixon Moore was, was more than happy to play that role. And you'll find in those memos and phone messages that pass along important elements in the campaign. And then Nixon provided that support one more time uh, right after the election in, in May of uh, April of 1985, when Reagan was under intense attack throughout the country by the Congress, by the press, and by his own wife, when um, there was a controversy over whether, whether or not he should go to Germany uh, to uh, lay a wreath on the on the uh, 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 on the on the cemetery of German soldiers. And they mistakenly, uh, snow had covered the, the cemetery, and uh, there were uh, SS soldiers at, uh, under the cemetery. And um, uh, nobody wanted him to go there. And so to make up for it, he was going to speak at the Bergen Belsen concentration camp. But they still didn't want him to go. And Nancy didn't want him to go. The press didn't want him to go. And, but Nixon provided the kind of support again when he sent uh, Reagan a secret memo, which I reproduce in the book, that backed up Reagan and reassured him that he was doing the right thing. So once again, uh, Nixon was there on, at his side. So anyway, I hope you'll enjoy reading about my time working with uh, President Reagan on his campaigns and the big speeches, and that's what the book is mostly about. But what makes this uh, book different, and especially because I'm here at the um, Nixon Library is, is the role that Nixon plays in it, and it's, it's an important message in this book. Um, that uh, and So when this library, the one we're sitting in, uh, opened exactly 34 years ago, last week, by the way, so it's a, almost another commemoration, Nixon asked me to join him on a visit with Reagan to Century City uh, two days before the library here opened. And uh, President Nixon called me and said, why don't you go with me? I'm going to go visit uh, uh, Reagan. And he said, why, why don't you accompany me? And I said, of course, that'd be, that's going to be great. And that's the last chapter of my book, when the two of them met. And it's uh, illustrated here. On, it's the cover of the book as well. And um, um, I call the, the chapter The Lions Gather. And... Um, it was it was such a extraordinary meeting where the the, the two presidents met. I, it's sort of like the equivalent of sitting in on a meeting between 
Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, um, the two giants of the Cold War. They talked about how they met, of current politics, their relationships with the Soviet Union, its personalities. It was such an amazing visit. And, uh, a friend of ours recently told me that she never saw me smile that well. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you would too if you were in that room. Um, in any event, it was such an amazing visit. And I think you'll find that chapter pretty amazing. It's a, it's a virtual transcription of their conversation. Because you can see I'm holding a folder in my hand. I was writing notes like crazy during the entire conversation. But they had a great relationship. So I'll say this. Uh, Nixon didn't seek anything personal from this relationship with Reagan. You, re you remember he, he wrote nine best-selling books after he left office. He gave, up, he gave up his Secret Service protection. Uh, he enjoyed his privacy. He enjoyed his grandchildren. He didn't seek uh, his name on aircraft carriers or monuments, or he didn't ask for freeways to be named after him. He didn't look for $100,000 for speaking engagements, like certain people that we know asked for <laughs> money for speaking engagements. And. Uh, Mr. Nixon did it because he loved being active and involved and to keep his mind engaged and to make a difference. And I will say this in conclusion, if Richard Nixon were alive today, I think leaders here and across the world would reach out for his wisdom and leadership, and I'm convinced we'd all be better off for it. Well, Ken, thank you very, very much for that incredible insight. We have time for some questions, so those of you that have them, please raise your hand, and I'll get around to as many as I can. Our first question from you, sir. What is your question? Hi. Uh, thank you so much for speaking. Uh, my question is about the intellectual merits of the two presidents that you were able to work with so closely in a time where presidential debates seem to be nothing more than yelling matches and presidential speeches just shouting of slogans. I'm curious, as you worked with President Nixon and President Reagan, what you observed of their intellectual uh, merits and their background, were they well-read? Uh, what were those kinds of conversations like uh, with those two presidents? Well, I think I described pretty much what it was like to have, um, what, what their intellect was like uh, during my talk. But uh, I will say this. Um, uh, President Nixon spent a lot of his time writing and thinking. Um, he, he spent time in his study. You would see piles and piles of his, of his notes on his legal pad, and he was well read. He traveled, to, he traveled and did a lot of foreign travel. And, and as I said, he wrote nine best selling books. You don't want to sell uh, Ronald Reagan short in this department because for years and years when he was on the, I, I, t I tell people this, he was on the General Electric Circuit um, as a lecturer and he traveled all over the country and he wrote all his own speeches, he did all his own research. Now, uh, Stu used to complain that he got his research out of human events and, and uh, Stu took away his human events from him for uh, when he campaigned for governor. <laughs> because <laughs> he was worried about the facts that he got out of it. But in any event, uh, but, but uh, Reagan studied very hard. He, and he had stacks and stacks and stacks of all his speeches that he wrote by himself. He was a good writer. He was a good editor. He had a good mind. And he studied very hard. So he, he had a great intellect. And um, I, I never sold him short. And he... He was bothered uh, quite often by the fact that uh, he was frustrated by those around him who didn't pay attention to his own sense of economics. And uh, I, I write about that in the book. Mr. Kachigian, right in the middle section in front of you. Hi, thanks for the speech tonight. It was great. I have a question. If theoretically, if uh, Nixon would not have been resigned, do you think Saigon would have fallen, or do you think it would be Saigon or South Vietnam would be uh, independent today and uh, free 
I think uh, North Vietnam would not have dared make the invasion that it did uh, because they were so frightened of him. That's my own thinking. The only hang up there is that the Congress took away all the funding. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, as you know, President Nixon, uh, when um, in 1972, when uh, North Vietnam violated the peace accords, uh, he sent the B-52 bombers into North Vietnam, which um, I guess I can say to scare the hell out of uh, North Vietnam and frighten them just tremendously. And they thought he was a bit of a madman. They weren't sure, quite sure what he would do. So I'm not sure they, they would have dared the, that invasion of South Vietnam when he was president. So I think there was, I, I can't predict the future, but I think there would have been a ex very good chance that South Vietnam would have survived. Ken, off to your right from a um, member of our Docent Guild, sir. So Ken, um, we get a lot of comments and questions here at the library about Richard Nixon. And with your um, very good knowledge of him and so forth, if you were asked by a common man what best describes the life of Richard Nixon, what word or phrase would you use to say uh, what you think his life or uh, his presidency did for us as a country? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a big question. <laughs> he, um, if you look at the state of the world uh, when he was president, uh, you have to look back at the condition of the Soviet Union and China in the uh, 60s and 70s. China was an outlaw country. And we, we think of China today as what it is today, where there's McDonald's and and Mercedes Benzes and Toyotas and uh, Apples and iPhones and everything else. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, China was a, just like North Korea is today. It was a complete outlaw country with red guards running all over the place. It, it was a crazed nation. He brought an outlaw country into the family of nations. Now, he, he's not responsible for what's happened to China in the, in the 90s uh, and since then between, you know, what other presidents have done. He's not responsible for what's happened. But he did bring them from an outlaw nation into a civil, fairly civilized nation. As for the Soviet Union, he did some very serious negotiations and strategic arms limitations talks and the uh, anti-ballistic missile treaties, and he engaged Soviet leaders in very serious discussions. So I think you have to look at what he did in the uh, in the foreign policy area is very serious, and and that was his legacy. Our next question: Did you accompany President Nixon to China, and if so, what was that trip like? No, I, I was I was too junior to accompany him. I I, I was just I didn't even get to go to the West Wing. <laughs> except to have lunch. <laughs> I will tell you this. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Um, we'll have time for one more question following this. Well, I'll leave, it, I'll leave it for a question. I won't tell another story then. OK, our next question. You, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, George Prezios of Brooklyn, New York. How are you, Ken? Good. Just wondering, how did John Connolly enter into Richard Nixon's orbit? And if Richard Nixon would have survived the second term, who do you think he would have supported in 76. Um, John Connolly uh, entered into his orbit in, uh, when he appointed him to the Secretary of Treasury. And he was um, you know, very high on Connolly. Uh, he just, uh, I don't know how he entered into the orbit. Uh, uh, perhaps the, through the acquaintance through Lyndon Johnson, I don't know. He, Reagan, uh, Nixon had a good relationship with President Johnson in the post-presidency, but he liked uh, Connolly be, just because he was a uh, very a strong individual. I think, I think Connolly endorsed him in the 72 campaign as well. Maybe that's, that was 
the, the acquaintanceship. I, I can't recall in particulars now. But anyway, Con Connelly was a very strong individual. And um, so I, I, that, that's the ma main relationship he would have had. Uh, what was the second part of your question? Oh, he would have supported? Um, the political part of him would have stayed neutral, but I think he would have, uh, he liked John Connolly so much. He would have, he, he was, he had a, he had a amp, sort of a, a bromance with John Connolly. He, he thought that Connolly would have been the best running mate for Reagan. Uh, but then he, but then he, 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 he said a lot of times to me, he said, you know, Connolly would be the best running mate, but he'd never pick him. Ken, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Ken will be available up in our front lobby to sign copies of Behind Closed Doors. Please pick up one, and we'll see you up there shortly. Thank you for coming. Good night.